Okay, so basically we are ready to start now uh, for the next talk, uh, which is called Rootkits as Reversing Tools. And you might be wondering why there's no one at the stage except for me. I'm just a herald, I'm not the speaker. Um, this is because this is uh, a first at the Congress. Uh, it's going to be an anonymous talk um, given uh, via voiceover IP via Tor and uh, virtual network com computing via Tor. So uh, I hope everything is set up completely now and uh, enjoy the show. Okay, so this is ELF2342, also known as the Space Pope, channeling through Alan Bradley uh, and routing through the Toy Network to talk to you about rootkits as reverse engineering tools featuring Tron. Um, but first, we should probably talk a bit as, as, as to why no one's at, before you at the podium. Um, so this is a, a proof of concept talk. Uh, the idea is to demonstrate that anonymous public speech is now a technical possibility. Uh, there may be some social difficulties involved. Um, we'll address those in the feedback at the end, I guess. So uh, to make this real, we're going to break uh, the, DM the USA DMCA live and with uh, mostly j uh, an act of speech. And the, the hope is uh, this sort of venue or format will be useful for those who research DRM or would like to give uh, censored talks in, in various countries. Um, it also serves as a nice demo uh, that, that the tour is, is useful for some interesting stuff, uh, other than just routing web pages and porn. Uh, so the DMCA uh, does, in fact, exist. So let's, let's look at, for since this is probably predominantly a non-US audience, let's look at this law a little bit. Um, the pertinent part is, states that uh, no person shall manufacture any component or part of any technology that has either limited commercially significant purpose uh, other than to circumvent copyright or is marketed by that person uh, for use in circumventing uh, copyright. So it seems like C should have first amendment issues. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe those have been uh, obviated by if, with commercial speech. I mean, Stan doesn't seem to enjoy a any protection uh, for better or for worse. So, um, but nonetheless, uh, th this does present quite a few uh, challenges or uh, problems for security researchers. Uh, do the, the first question, I guess, is do free research tools have commercially significant purposes? Maybe, maybe not. If you're giving something away for free, maybe it won't see use. Maybe nobody will find it useful. Maybe there are better alternatives. That it, after all, it's a research tool. You're basically just experimenting. Um, so you don't really know about point B. You don't really know if your, your tool has other commercially significant use, uh, even if you think it, 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 it should. So then what counts as marketing? And this seems awfully close to speech. Uh, if I could, just were to tell the truth, if someone were to ask me what are some of the uses of Tron, and I say, well, yeah, one of them is, in fact, can be used as a component uh, to help certain circumvent some copy protection scheme somewhere. Uh, if I say that, it, it seems like I've, I, I've run afoul of point C back there. So I mean, anything, and this is true, Tron is a, is a memory cloaker, for those of you who haven't seen the abstract. Uh, it, it can cloak modifications to uh, program memory. So any copy protection that will rely on uh, verifying the integrity of its code is, 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 a, is a target for this. You can cloak that, that your crack of this code and then ship it with Tron. Of course, this may be a little bit ridiculous to ship a kernel driver with your wares. And there are probably better ways to do this, but you know, it, it can be done. It is possible to use this thing in this way. I'm not going to say otherwise, because you know, what the hell. All right. So we have a lot. We have a lot to cover. Um, we have two rootkits uh, used primarily as re reversing tools. Uh, rootkit support lib to, to help these out, and an IDA pro plugin. And then we're going to also discuss. Talk set, uh, the talk set up, how basically all this was, was done. So the goals for the rootkits for the tools are basically debugger hiding and 
code modification and instrumentation. Uh, it has applications in malware research, uh, things like Skype that verify the integrity of their code to search for breakpoints uh, to prevent reverse engineering and, and are active in searching for debuggers. Uh, DRM research, of course, which is uh, illegal if not a serious gray area. Um, and then cheating at online games. So first we're going to discuss Tron, but by way of that we probably should do a little bit of recap of, of how virtual memory works. Um, so basically you have this component of your processor, the memory management unit, and this handles translations from virtual addresses, which are the addresses in, your, in each individual program that are distinct from one another. And then these get translated by this NMU into the physical addresses, which are the actual addresses on your uh, memory chips. So these, and these mappings are described in these three-level data structures called page tables. So each lookup through these page tables requires three memory addresses to translate one virtual address to a physical address. So obviously, this is uh, quite, ex quite an expensive operation. So these are this, these data, these mappings are, are cached in two uh, TLBs, or translation look aside buffers. And these, uh, there, there's one for code, basically, and one for data. And there's also a distinction between uh, uh, supervisor and user TLBs. And at every context switch, the user land TLBs are flushed. So that all these mappings are all your user land. Every time you switch to a new process, uh, those are all expired. And then the page table lookup happens and primes the, the TLBs. Uh, each, each time there's a process switch. But these things are not expired at, at a thread switch, which makes sense. You don't want to needlessly expire your, your mappings, uh, your virtual address, the physical address mappings, if the virtual address is not going to change a virtual address space. So this is the, a diagram from the Intel manuals of the uh, page table, page tables. At the top here, you have a virtual address, which is broken into three components. The top 10 bits are used to get uh, your offset into the page directory. And this whole structure is, is started off by the CPU uh, reading off its CR3 register. So it basically adds these 10 bits to the base of the page directory, gets a page table entry, uses the next 10 bits to uh, offset into this page table to give you a physical page frame. And then the last 12 bits. 4096 are, are an offset into this 4 kilobyte page frame and finally giving you that, that physical address uh, that, that is the end result of this translation from the virtual or linear address. So, so that's the virtual memory recap. Let's recap uh, Shadow Walker. So uh, I guess first of all, when is the page fault handler called in general? Uh, in the kernel, the page fault handler is called if you have a translation look aside buffer fa uh, lookup fail. And then, uh, after this lookup fails, the page table, the processor automatically tra traverses the page table. And if it sees that the page table is marked as non-present, or it can't write to it, your write access bit is, is, is not set, or it can't execute on newer x86s, the, ex the execute bit is not set. And then there's one more, the supervisor uh, bit, uh, if that's not set. Uh, then a page fault is triggered, and the page fault handler begins executing. So the idea then of Shadow Walker is to mark pages invalid somehow. Uh, you could either do not present, or you could do user supervisor uh, distinction uh, to cause a, a page fault to happen. Um, so when when this page fault handler calls you is called, you hook it in some way. So you have a so you you basically divert execution by either installing your own interrupt handler that calls the original or putting a jump at the beginning of the original or something like this, uh, then your page fault handler checks to see if this is a hook page. And if it is a hook page, the one that you're trying to hide or, 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 or conceal modifications to, the page fault handler decides whether to put fake or valid data into the TLB depending on the access type and, and the permissions for this. So if the so if the uh, uh, instruction pointer of the fault is the faulting address, then you know that you have a code access. So the instruction pointer causes a fault. Uh, otherwise, you have a data access. So you can prime the 
the instruction TLD, if it's a code access, with call instruction. And you can prime the data TLD with a move, basically, to read at that address um, after you put the pr proper physical address in your page table. So uh, not to knock uh, the Shadow Walker work, it was really, it's really quite impressive. But it, it does have um, you know, some limitations. And they, most of these they specified in, in their paper. So they, they weren't really pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. They were quite open about this. Uh, it, it doesn't handle uh, cop writes or, or copy and write uh, behavior. You basically either have to pre-touch all the pages, and uh, you also have to put a little bit of logic to handle to handle writes uh, of this memory. There are uh, races in a threaded environment. They don't really address this at all. Um, uh, at least the solution. They they give some vague ideas, but don't really uh, uh, provide any sort of solution. Um, there's no user land support at all. Uh, primarily a rootkit uh, technique for cloaking kernel memory. And then I think that they sort of looked at this the wrong way. I think this is probably uh, one of the bigger uh, flaws. Um, I think it's, it's sort of a hindrance to think about this as a schism between instruction TLD and data TLD. But uh, I think it's better to think of it as, as what's in the page table and what's in the TLD at any given time, whether it's fake data or hidden data. If you think about things this way, then an, uh, an API just sort of falls out of this thought pattern, and then code and data cloaking become possible, independent of one another, uh, and a whole and you can develop all sorts of permissions based on the, uh, the access point, uh, the accessing instruction, and so on. Ooh, uh, we lost audio. Uh, okay. All right. So um, hopefully we didn't lose too much audio there. Uh, so basically, I was just saying that code and data cloaking is possible because if you if you uh, change your way of thinking about this. Also, I don't think it's so useful to hide rootkits because you can always check the page fault handler uh, check to see if it's hooked. You can do some advanced techniques like Greg Hogland's uh, shadow branching uh, is a possibility. Um, but um, that can be detected as well if you're in the kernel. Um, so Keytron features. So what does Tron do in addition to fixing those limitations that, that uh, Shadow Walker does not? Uh, it allows you to null cloak memory, um, it, which is basically making your memory look unmapped. And, and, and system calls that deal with this memory are going to report that it's unmapped as well. Virtual query will tell you that it's unmapped. Um, and system, kernel system calls on it will, will say that access denied it's unmapped. Um, and then also, the kernel is not trusted so that programs can't just use their syscalls to verify their, their memory. Normal memory permissions are enforced to the best of our ability. Um, and then race proofing APIs are, are provided to deal, with, to deal with the race conditions. So, so let's have a look at uh, what this hidden memory looks like. Um, so you ha basically have two views of a given uh, virtual address range. You have the hidden view that contains your evil code or evil data, and your fake view that contains your normal code and normal data. And like I said, you can also have no cloak memory with it where your evil code is, is in fact mapped, where, and when, that, when the other code tries to access this, it ends up as, uh, it, it shows up as not mapped. So what about uh, permissions for this? So how, it, it, these mappings are well and good, but how do you govern what, what access what ma mappings? Well, you can set up uh, regions of allowed code which are based purely on instruction pointer only. This doesn't like track your call stack or anything. Purely on instruction pointer, you can say that this this region of memory is allowed to access your evil code, and then uh, the, and basically anything else will get the fake view. And you can also do self-allowed memory, where the evil code is allowed to access itself, and the other code is given the unmapped view. So what are the, how do the APIs work? Uh, all these APIs are basically macros that are exported in the user land header that have a non tijack of virtual alloc, which means that there's basically a 64-bit key that's given to virtual alloc. And if that key matches the in the kernel, 